Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from safeddeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, safeddeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course. Go to safeddeen.com and sign up now. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by Orange Pill App, the Bitcoin-only social network that connects you with high-signal Bitcoiners, events, and now merchants as well. If you're like me and can't stop talking about Bitcoin, you know how challenging it can be to talk to the no-coiners and how nice it is to talk to someone who gets you. With the Orange Pill app, you can find the Bitcoiners near you and they can replace the no-coiners in your life. You can organize events and meetups with local Bitcoiners and wherever you travel, you can meet up with local Bitcoiners all while being as anonymous as you like. So if you want to build your local network of Bitcoiners, find a Bitcoin meetup or merchants accepting Bitcoin, head over to orangepillapp.com to sign up or download the app from the App Store or Google Play Store and send me a DM so we can get connected. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the Sats card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin Standard Sats card, which carries the Bitcoin Standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin Standard. Use the code Bitcoin Standard to get 5% off your purchase. This podcast is also brought to you by The Bitcoin Way, your professional Bitcoin IT team offering you personalized, secure, and comprehensive solutions for every step along your Bitcoin journey. The Bitcoin Way offer live concierge service to guide you with your Bitcoin cold storage, running your node, privacy best practices, inheritance planning, corporate strategy, and multi-sig solutions. They don't touch your coins, they guide you through the process of acquiring your coins and securing them. If you'd like to make your setup safer and more reliable, book a consult with them and see what they have to suggest. If you want to give someone the gift of Bitcoin, Get them this professional service that will ensure they start off knowing exactly how to manage their coins and not lose them. Go to thebitcoinway.com and start Bitcoining more confidently. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who is the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, where he holds the rank of university professor. He was director of the Earth Institute from 2002 to 2016. He is president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and has served as special advisor to UN Secretaries Generals Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon, and Antonio Guterres. But perhaps more important than all of that, as far as I'm concerned, is Professor Sachs was my professor at Columbia University 20 years ago. And for, and for me, that's what's important too. <laughs> so that's, that's cool. <laughs> 20 years ago. It was 20 years ago when I, when I joined Columbia, 2004, which is incredible to think oh uh, how God. time flies. Oh my God. <laughs> 20 years ago, I joined the Columbia University PhD program in sustainable development, which Professor Sachs uh, directs. He was the director of the program. I spent five years there, which I learned quite a lot. I've uh, not spoken to Professor Sachs in a while, but uh, given recent events and what he's been saying, I thought it would be great to bring him along and to get his opinion on a subject that he's been very vocal on, which is the genocide in uh, Gaza. Uh, thank you so much for joining, Professor. Thank you so much for all of the outspoken um, positions you have taken, which couldn't have been easy in today's uh, environment. And uh, thank you for giving us the time. Oh, it's great. So great to be with you. And the congratulations on all you're doing. It's, it's amazing. We're proud of you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. So I guess uh, let's get straight into it. Um, what is your opinion of what is going on in uh, Gaza right now? Well, it, it's a genocide. Uh, and I think the International Court of Justice will 
most likely reach that uh, definitive conclusion when it makes its uh, final uh, decision. It made an interim decision saying that there were plausible grounds uh, that Israel is committing a genocide. More recently, uh, the special rapporteur of the Human Rights Council has uh, also said that uh, Israel is uh, uh, making uh, genocidal actions uh, according to uh, the standards of the 1948 Genocide Convention. So genocide is, uh, uh, of course, is a horrific crime, but it's also a legal standard. Uh, it's based on uh, a global convention uh, that was uh, promulgated and adopted in 1948 uh, after the Holocaust, uh, and it, it puts forward uh, rigorous conditions, and it seems to me that Israel is uh, violating those conditions. Uh, uh, ultimately, uh, while there's the very practical issue of the war and the deaths, uh, and that is a practical uh, issue for politics, uh, diplomats, uh, statesmen, and the like, there's also a legal standard which will be adjudicated uh, and uh, which, to my mind, uh, points to this completely shocking and awful fact that uh, we are most likely seeing a genocide before our eyes. And it's been going on for months. And the world, uh, not the world, uh, the big powers and especially the United States uh, are unwilling, unable to take basic actions to stop it. So the difference of uh, this and the Holocaust or other earlier genocides is that they weren't uh, recorded day by day uh, on video. Uh, and now we see uh, live coverage. Uh, we see uh, journalistic reports, albeit Israel is almost surely targeting and killing journalists uh, in large numbers. This is another basic fact in an attempt to uh, hide what's going on. But Israeli uh, soldiers uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces themselves post their own videos celebrating the destruction of Gaza. So we see day to day, and yet the world doesn't stop it. Yeah, it's absolutely devastating to be watching this. The, the, the toll that it has taken on people for six months is just insane. I think um, I, I agree with you, obviously. And I think one thing that is perhaps um, unique about this genocide, as far as I can tell, I don't think there are many genocides where uh, the leaders of the perpetrating army were quite so vocal and so clear about the fact that they are out there to destroy an entire population. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, if, if Palestinians had tried to fabricate um, fake quotes made by Israeli leaders, I don't think they could have come up with something as damning as what the Israeli leaders themselves have said. I mean, you, you have the president of Israel who said, there is no such thing as an innocent civilian in Gaza. We're talking about a population of 2.3 million people, half of which is under the age of 18, roughly. And so a very large number of children and it's he's just out there saying, you know, for us, there are no innocent civilians. The prime minister of Israel is also going on about um, invoking vi verses from the Bible, which specifically instruct to spare no child, no woman, not even spare their cattle. And um, this is what the soldiers are singing about and posting on YouTube. We've never had anything like this. I don't, um, I mean, I think perhaps in the Ru Rwandan genocide, there was uh, some kind of public, uh, but people, the world wasn't paying attention. So it wasn't as if the Rwandan leadership was getting on CNN and saying, no, 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 there's no such thing as um, uh, innocence there. But here we do, we have it. It's all being televised and all being transmitted. And it's, 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 it's startling. Yeah, what, what I think is uh, uh, very uh, interesting about this is, first, these statements, uh, these videos uh, uh, are all being listed, recorded, uh, and submitted to the International Court of Justice. So this is the body of evidence. Uh, and as you say, the Israeli leaders have made their own body of evidence. They haven't hidden it. Uh, you just watch, uh, and it's unbelievable. Second, uh, it's clear that they live in a bubble. Uh, they're talking to their own followers. Uh, they're at rallies uh, as if no one else is listening, but they're all being recorded. And then 
translated. A third, they think I'm sensing that by speaking in Hebrew, uh, they're not speaking to the world, but the world hears all of this. It's not so hard to translate, uh, to uh, put uh, subtitles uh, to uh, the videos. I think uh, what you said is uh, extremely right and important about the biblical quotations because there's something, uh, you know, complicated uh, going on. Israeli society is uh, multi layered. Uh, there are many secular Jews who are afraid and uh, they are subject to, uh, to fear uh, and fear mongering. Uh, there are also highly religious Jews who live uh, in a biblical or Talmudic world, meaning that their reference points are literally the Bible, not as a, an ancient text, but uh, as their daily touchstone and reality. And in for a very important part of uh, religious Judaism in Israel, it's uh, the Talmud, which is uh, the uh, interpretations of the Bible uh, written down from oral law and then further interpretation roughly from uh, the, the first century AD up to the fourth or fifth century AD. So there's a lot of truly medieval thinking uh, underway uh, and even uh, biblical primitivism, I would say. And in the Bible, uh, it's pretty shocking when you read the Bible, uh, uh, the uh, Old Testament, especially parts of uh, the book of Deuteronomy and uh, a book uh, called the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua is uh, after the first five books of the Old Testament, which is the Jewish Torah. Uh, the next book is about the conquest of uh, the land of Canaan, which then became uh, the uh, basically the land uh, that is claimed by uh, Israelis today. And that was through a conquest uh, in the Jewish lore, uh, the Jewish uh, uh, story. Uh, Jews uh, escaped from Egypt, from the burdens of the Pharaoh, where they were slaves uh, onto Egypt. They escaped, led by Moses. Uh, they uh, wandered in the desert for 40 years. And then they conquered the lands that had other people in it. Uh, so this is uh, actually the religious story. And it's based on the idea that God gave uh, a promise to the Jewish people that this would be their land. And when they conquer the land in the book of Joshua, it's literally genocides, one after another. Uh, there are named populations and the instructions to the uh, Hebrews that have uh, come to conquer the land is kill everybody in it. Pretty strange, actually, I have to say, uh, I'm you know very secular. Uh, reading this as religion is, is pretty grim. Uh, that it's a, a command of genocide. It's not, we had a war to conquer what God promised us, but rather the instruction is, don't be shy, Joshua. <laughs> don't hold back. Kill every man, woman, and child. And uh, so it's, it is a text, sad to say, uh, of genocide and bloodshed. And then it's interpreted by rabbis uh, in the Talmud afterwards. Okay, there's lots that can be said about uh, ancient religious texts, but reading them literally as if it's the 2024 reality is not a very prudent thing to do, in my opinion. Uh, it is a, an invitation to mass killing. And the reason I go into all of this is that sad to say, and it's shocking for me is because I'm an American Jew, uh, to hear rabbis speak in this way. Uh, rabbis, you know, a rabbi for me is a, is a religious figure. And uh, in, in my upbringing, the idea was a rabbi was a, a, a holder of ethics, you know, who helped to inform ethics uh, in 
our Jewish community. But the ethics that the rabbis, uh, not everyone by any means, so I don't want to uh, be misunderstood, but there's a part of Israeli society that's very powerful politically right now in which the rabbis talk about mass slaughter of Palestinians as if it's basically the command of the book of Joshua. And to hear this is stunning. There are tapes that one can find of uh, rabbis who lead yeshivas, you know, uh, these are religious schools, who are asked by their followers, and they're on video. Uh, These are then posted. Rabbi, do you mean to kill all the men and women? Yes, yes, they are all guilty. They are all supporters. They are our enemies. They want to kill us. Rabbi, do you mean to kill the children? Yes, yes, we should kill the children because they will grow up to be haters to kill us. And this is rabbis talking. So part of this that we're seeing of this lack of disguise of, you know, intention is actually deep belief uh, that is not seen with inside this uh, uh, belief system as something wrong, but as actually something religious. I'm sorry to say it, it's, it's, it's grim. And over time, there have been, there have been uh, very knowledgeable religious Jewish critics in Israel over the last 50 years who wrote some important books that I had never read until the last year, and in fact, until recently in, in many cases, to try to understand what's going on, who warned about this who said, look, this is what this strain of Judaism actually believes. It's not the Judaism I was uh, at all uh, inculcated with uh, as an American, uh, because I grew up in in America in in what is necessarily a pluralistic society, and you don't base daily life on uh, the Bible or on the Talmud, but some do. And then you get these unbelievable distortions that for me are completely shocking, but really are genocidal in clear intent and not hidden because they're not understood to be something to hide. They're understood to be something to follow God's will even. So this is part of the story. It's rather complicated. It's not the whole story but it's definitely a feature of what's happening right now. I agree entirely. And I think it's something that most people are afraid to touch upon because obviously this is, I mean, any any kind of discussion of anything critical of Israel is immediately going to get you labeled an anti-Semite. But if you... But by the way, you know, just to, just to say, say I, I can only surmise I'm very well read in general because I've spent my whole life with a book in my hand, basically. Uh, and I try to pack in every day as much understanding as I can. And I've spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, my own religious heritage and so forth. And I didn't know a lot of this until recently. And it was only looking at Smotrich and Ben Gavir and hearing these horrible, horrible, horrible things coming out of their mouth and then going back and understanding that there were some very sophisticated uh, warnings and analysis about this by professors at Hebrew University and elsewhere who were then ostracized, by the way, uh, in Israeli society, you know, uh, on exactly the grounds you said. But the reason I mention it is I really doubt that a lot of the American rich Jews who are very powerful in the Israel lobby in the United States have a clue about this. I don't think they know. I don't think they understand. Of course, they should be listening. They should be watching. And the basic point is, it cannot be right under any circumstances in the world to be killing civilians in mass numbers, no matter what, period. It's not even complicated. So I don't forgive them but I do believe they don't understand uh, actually the even the cultural and in some cases the religious roots of this. And of course, you're not allowed to say it, but the, the basic point is we need to speak as truthfully as possible for our own survival. That's the basic point. 
Absolutely, I agree entirely. I mean, I remember after September 11, uh, there was open season on discussing how Islam um, contributes to terrorism, whether Islam is a religion of peace or Islam is a religion for terrorism. And I think that there's merit in having those arguments, whatever your opinion is. Yeah, and by the way, you usually claims that it's a religion of violence by people who don't have the slightest idea of what Islam actually is, but by American evangelical preachers who dominated the American scene. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's, a, lot, um, it's a lot clearer, in fact, in Islam. Sure, some Muslims commit terrorism, but I think the, the injunction against harming women and children is pretty clear and uncontroversial. Even if some people might today misinterpret it or interpret it in a different way or say that uh, the conditions are different, so we need to carry it out. But it's very difficult to make an argument for it. It's a lot more complicated when it comes to the Bible and the Talmud because the Talmud also is, is more complicated to read because it's not as if it is out there giving you clear directive like Sharia law, which is saying you do this, you don't do that. It's Yeah, no, it's very, very complicated by the yeah, way, very it's, few it's, people, it's, it's, except if you spent a, a decades in a yeshiva. <laughs> really know much about it. And, it. and it's all about, you know, considering the viewpoint and the counter viewpoint and then coming up with other counter viewpoints and it's rabbis adding on to this over decades and centuries. So it's, you know, it, it can get very controversial about what does this actually mean? So there's some pretty shocking verses you know, about um, even raping children or things like that. But a more nuanced understanding is that, well, no, this is, they're making the argument and they are making the argument for and argument against. I guess you could maybe um, make that case, but there is a big spectrum. And I think it's just, it, it's left unsaid that the, spec, the part of that spectrum that is becoming dominant in Israeli policy over the past few years, but has always been extremely influential and was arguably very influential in 1948 as well, is the most hardline interpretation, which sees nothing but the idea that there's us, we're a tribe, and everybody who is going to get in our way deserves whatever is coming to them. And this is our land. God gave it to us. And so for me, the the, the, the really um, horrific aspect of this is how it, it, it contradicts reality. Well, God gave you the land, and now there's children whose families have been living on that land for hundreds of years. Now, any civilized human being thinks, okay, this is property, right? Those people own that property. I can't take it from them. But only, it, it takes a special kind of religious fundamentalism to say, nope, that's completely invalid. It doesn't matter if you've owned that land. We can just completely get over that and we're going to kick you out. And if you fight back, we're going to have to murder you and murder your entire family. And this is, this is very mainstream. Yeah, well, just to say, uh, the, the history is um, complicated uh, and uh, the complexities are, you know, fascinating, but I, they don't in any way change my perception of the immediate situation, which is that this is a genocide that needs to stop today. But just to say, the you know, the first Zionist uh, uh, of, uh, of, of modern Jewish history, uh, Theodor Herzl in Vienna, knew nothing about Judaism. <laughs> you know, he's basically completely secular. Uh, he was not interested in the Holy Land per se. Uh, he was uh, interested uh, in uh, a homeland for Jews because nationalism at the end of the 19th century was the absolute predominant ideology of the world, that you weren't anything if you didn't have a nation. Uh, and so Herzl, who knew nothing about Judaism, uh, looked around uh, and he had lots of ideas. Uganda, of course, was one famous uh, place that he looked for. Uh, and history took its path. And uh, Britain, definitely one of the most cynical countries uh, in history, <laughs> uh, promised, uh, <coughs> promised uh, the land of what is today uh, Israel and Palestine multiple times over to the Arabs, to the French, uh, and to the Jews. Uh, so uh, nothing like uh, British perfidy. Uh, I think it's unrivaled. Whatever America knows, it learned from Britain as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so in any event, that started, and most of the original Zionists were not religious. Uh, in fact, uh, so many were uh, deeply secular socialists, uh, anti-religious, uh, and society became 
complicated. But for me, what I, you know, my experience with Israel personally, of course, I have family in Israel and, uh, and, and therefore uh, deeper relations, but my personal experience with Israel goes back uh, to 1972, which was my first trip, so 52 years ago. And at the time, Israel was viewed broadly as a secular society. Uh, and of course, there was a religious component, uh, but it was definitely a minority. And, you know, even as today, looked uh, down upon by the secularists and so forth. And the ideology of Israel was still pretty much a socialist kind of workers' party, uh, secular ideology. The Six Day War was a, uh, of course, one can go back and talk about 1947 and 48, and there's a lot to talk about, but I just want to start with 1967 because the Six-Day War had, uh, practically speaking, uh, the, the effects that have led us to today in two different ways. When I first arrived in Israel in 1972, the just about the first thing that was explained to me was that Israel was going to establish settlements in the Palestinian captured territories. And the phrase that was introduced to me for the first time, I was a high school student, was to make facts on the ground. So this was a a completely, in my view at the time, secular uh, view. It had a mix of security. It had a mix of why not? We won this territory. But the idea was, we're going to settle these occupied lands. And that was uh, a plan by a famous general at the time, uh, Alon. It was called the Alon Plan. Uh, And Alon was not doing it on the grounds of Deuteronomy or the Book of Joshua or anything else. He was doing it on a mix of, I think... uh, for him, overwhelmingly security. Okay, we're going to have security outposts throughout the West Bank on the Jordan River, et cetera, et cetera. And it became uh, more generally an idea, you know, you, you win, you conquered, uh, so we're going to uh, make settlements. But then what happened, and I watched it, and I didn't understand it very well over time, suddenly uh, there were demonstrations, uh, or you'd see spontaneous dancing in the streets in the late 70s and early 80s of young people with, you know, religious skull caps, a kippah in Hebrew, kippot, uh, dancing in this zealous way. And I asked, what is this? Uh, and it was a group called Gush Emonim. Uh, and this is a new religious movement. Now, what was that? This was the New Settlers Movement, and it was led by rabbis, famous rabbis, who started preaching the religious line that this is our responsibility, almost a messianic responsibility to settle uh, these occupied lands because God gave us these lands. I believe, I'm not the deepest scholar in this, but I believe that there was a shift uh, from the secularism, cynical, uh, and and so forth, but from the secularism to this religious movement that came with the settlements in the 1970s and 1980s. And there's some famous rabbis, uh, Rabbi Cook, the old elder, and Rabbi Cook, the younger, his son, uh, who promulgated a, a religious philosophy based on the Bible that this is our land, God promised it, we're going to take it, and this is the redemption of the Jewish people through this. And of course, these settlements exploded in number uh, to hundreds of thousands, and a lot of it was this religious movement. A lot of it was people who wanted uh, swimming pools uh, and cheap real estate, so it was, uh, you know, also totally uh, opportunistic, but a lot of it was the religious movement. 
My own guess is that this was really something new. And by the way, there were divisions in the Orthodox community because one of the most powerful of the traditional Orthodox communities here in Brooklyn, uh, the Satmar community, is absolutely anti-Zionist, saying, uh, you know, it's idolatry to uh, give so much uh, attention to the land. We need to give attention to our morality, not to the land. And so you can find rabbis standing outside of the UN uh, holding signs that say uh, Zionism is against Judaism. And so there ensued within the religious communities a debate and a division in the 1980s onward. Uh, And there is a religious Zionism, which is messianic. Uh, It's based on Deuteronomy. It's based on the book of Joshua. It's based on the Talmud. It's based on the things we were talking about. There are other uh, strands of religious Judaism that say exactly the opposite. But what I think happened in Israel is that uh, this religious zealotry gained weight. And, you know, in game theory, as you know well, uh, the weight does not depend strictly on your share of the vote or your share of the population or your share of uh, the uh, seats in the parliament or the Knesset uh, in Israel's case. It depends on whether you determine the governing coalition. And these uh, religious parties that are in this nationalist religious line, and they're represented by uh, this uh, Bezalel Smotrich, for example, who is a leader of the settler movement and is a vulgarian and a genocidal figure, as far as I'm concerned, and a senior official in the cabinet, is one of these coalition makers Netanyahu, who is absolutely one of the darkest and most cynical politicians in modern times, depends on this religious uh, zealot for staying in power. We say in game theory that uh, these small parties have high shapely values. It means that they have a high proportion of uh, determining the coalition in power, even though they're not so dominant in the vote. And Ben Gavir is another one. These are horrible people, in my view. Uh, You know, they are murderous zealots. Uh, They believe what they say. That's why they're not hiding it. Uh, They speak to their followers. They have a huge weight in current Israeli politics because they'll bring down the government. Uh, And Netanyahu, who, who knows what his views are, he'll do anything and he'll kill women and children in mass numbers to stay in power. This is absolutely clear with Netanyahu. He's a a perversion of politics uh, in this way. But I think there was this change that is notable, uh, maybe for Palestinians under the bombs. It's all very theoretical, what I've just said. But I think it's uh, just important to understand how this evolved over time. The syllabus for my new online economics course, Principles of Economics, is now available on safedean.com. The course will take place over 18 lectures, each based on one chapter from my new book, Principles of Economics, which will be available for free as an ebook for everyone registering for the course. Lectures will be released once every two weeks on Mondays, starting on the 25th of September, 2023, and will be available in video and audio format. Live discussion seminars will be held once a week on Thursdays at alternating time slots, 12 hours apart, to ensure learners can attend from all over the world. I'm happy to announce that I have set up my new publishing house and online bookstore, The Safe House, which will be publishing and delivering the best Bitcoin and Austrian economics books worldwide in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook formats. Go to thesafehouse.com to buy my latest book, Principles of Economics, as well as the Fiat Standard and the Bitcoin Standard. And now I'm also publishing Fiat Food, Matthew Lishak's amazing investigation into how inflation ruined our diet and health. And I'm also publishing Lynn Alden's Broken Money, her masterful exploration of the failures of the global financial system and how Bitcoin fixes it. 
This is a Bitcoiner's bookshop, so the books are printed in beautiful cloth hardcover made to last with a nice colored dust jacket on top. Go to thesafehouse.com and get yours now. And why there really is this religious nationalist element to it that is barely understood in the United States, you know, because for American Jews, the, the, the ones that we learned about, talked about, admired, uh, whether it's Ben-Gurion or uh, Golda Meir or Abba Iban uh, or, uh, or uh, Yitzhak Rabin uh, uh, or Shimon Peres, whatever one thinks of them, and I'm sure the Palestinians don't like them at all for any way, shape or form, they are not these religious zealots. They were very different in their orientation and something really has changed. And so we're seeing rabbis and we're seeing cabinet ministers openly calling for genocide, which was not the case 50 years ago. Very true. Very true. I think that's very astute. And I think I would say uh, part of the shift is just demographics. Secular people in Israel have much lower birth rate, whereas uh, religious people have a higher birth rate. And I think um, to go back to the point that I made earlier, there's just too much room for interpretation of the text. So as you said, there are a lot of very religious Jews who are anti-Zionist and who see that Zionism as a nation state is an abomination for Judaism because Judaism is a religion. It's not a nation and it's not, it's not supposed to be a modern government. So you could interpret the Bible and the Talmud in all kinds of different ways. And I think the really uh, concerning thing is that uh, it's the dynamic of the Israeli government having the uh, unflinching support of the United States that encourages all of the worst elements within Israeli society because the more conflict, the more settlements, the more conquering, the more uh, war, the more murder, the more you can raise money in the U.S., the more you can get people agitated about this in the U.S., the more you can get the billionaires in the U.S. to start getting really agitated and um you know, um, threatening Harvard with uh, to fires on all of that stuff. That's a lot of money. And of course, even more important than that, of course, is the military industrial complex, which stands to make enormous amounts of money. So it's a very perverse incentive where the government in its own, the fact that it has this enormous amount of money and power and weapons and the backing of the world's only superpower is by its is constantly encouraging the worst elements within Israeli society to come up to the fore because more conflict is good for business. Yeah, I I think the situation in the United States is actually even simpler, uh, and and that is uh, the Israeli lobby, by the way, which is this strange amalgamation of uh, rich Jews to an important extent and uh, evangelicals. Uh, who uh, have their own l biblical literalism, uh, you know, looking for uh, the uh, Armageddon, uh, which uh, they think depends on uh, Israel holding uh, these lands, um, is simply very powerful in the U.S. and has been powerful for a long time uh, and uh, has a lot of uh, financial resources and America, uh, American democracy is, is, uh, one dollar, one vote. You know, it's uh, basically a completely corrupt political system based on uh, raising uh, money for uh, expensive campaigns. So the Israeli lobby has long had a uh, high influence. From the point of view of most American Jews, I can tell you from my own experience, and I think it's pretty standard, support for Israel was deeply enculturated, uh, you know, uh, for American Jewry, period. Uh, and again, it was not seen or foreseen uh, that this was a genocidal impulse, and it was on overwhelmingly secular ground. So there's very little uh, religious orthodoxy in the Israel lobby at all. You don't even hear about it. My own guess is the following, therefore, it's, you know, again, not an insider's view. First, I don't think most wealthy American uh, leader, political figures or leaders of the Israel lobby 
And that's a lot of people on Wall Street, for example, a lot of very big money. Um, I don't think they really understand much at all about this biblical or philosophical or religious nationalist or ideological view. It's more a knee-jerk support Israel, uh, period. Israel's under threat, support it, period. So I, I think that there's very little understanding. Uh, and again, I'm being a little bit introspective because my own understanding uh, um, needed a massive scaling up uh, just to understand what was going on and who are these figures, uh, many of whom I had never heard of before uh, until they became agents of uh, genocide. So this, this is uh, one part. Second, an, a politician like Biden, who's nothing but an old school politician, we have no idea what his real state of mind is, capacity to think or anything else right now, frankly. But his instinct completely is don't show a shade of gap with Israel. Now, by the way, even saying that, it's amazing how even Biden has been out there saying this is terrible what's happening and have some more bombs, by the way. Uh, so I don't think it's cynical, actually, although, of course, in outcome, it's profoundly cynical. It's pathetic is what it is. It's pathetic in that Biden, as a person, clearly sees this is horrendous. It's not a fake. Uh, it's not a disguise. But what's pathetic is how weak it is, because the guy, for God's sake, is president of the United States. And he should pick up the phone and say to Netanyahu, you're not getting any more weapons, period. Not with this mass killing. And the United States could shut this down in a day if it chose to. But it doesn't choose to, not because it supports genocide or ethnic cleansing, uh, but because it's so deeply ingrained, don't get ahead of the Israeli lobby bulldozer. It's a bad thing to do. Now, even with all of that, you know, the American Jewish community is at this point pretty much in angst and deeply divided. It's in, in this way, a, a little bit impressive, I would say, although you wouldn't think it's too impressive, but, uh, you know, support for Israel is collapsing among the Jews in America. Not, not just among American society more generally. What's happening is disgraceful, disgusting, illegal, murderous. There's no other word for it uh, and or words for it. Uh, and so this is actually permeating a lot of American society. But the political class doesn't live on public opinion. It lives on campaign contributions. And so one big billionaire campaign contributor outweighs a hell of a lot of percentage points of American public opinion till now. I'm not giving up. I'm speaking out because I want the United States to stop arming Israel, period. And not in weeks or months, today, this hour, this moment, and I'm making the point every day because I live in the UN context. We're the last bulwark for a genocide right now. No one else supports this in the whole world. By the way, no one else practically could support it. Some European countries like Germany are afraid to speak out for their own historical and political reasons. But it's only the United States practically that enables this to go on hour by hour. And so I'm trying to make the case in the US, we're completely isolated. It's completely horrible. It is not complicated. It is not complicated. It's not, oh my God, what are we going to do about Hamas and so forth? There are other ways to security than killing tens of thousands of people and starving hundreds of thousands of people. There is such a thing called diplomacy. And this is conveniently or inconveniently or obnoxiously forgotten by the United States because they're not trying diplomacy, but 
this is the the, the real answer. No, I, I agree with you. And I think um, I think the, the, what you're saying is really very profound. I think for the vast majority of Americans, and I've lived in America, and uh, the idea of Israel is just this romantic thing from Hollywood. I call it Harvey Weinstein Zionism, essentially, where you just get your ideas from all of these amazing Hollywood films where Israel is the underdog that's out there making the deserts bloom and being fought by all these irrational, crazy people who just hate them for the sake of hating them. It's a good point, by the way. You know, the bestseller movie was Exodus, mm-hmm. not Nakba. So, exactly. <laughs> you know, if there, if, if there was Nakba, there would also be understanding uh, of, uh, you know, what this is uh, all about. Yeah. So you could really have a human solution. But uh, it it is a set of uh, images and not a deep understanding which is a big problem and it's it continues to become more and more separated from the reality on the ground because as you said today's israel is being controlled i mean the most important influential ministers are the two you mentioned uh smotrich and ben gvir and i think i mean you don't have anybody that can be in any way comparable within american politics it's it's completely un- unimaginable for anyone to come up in the U.S. and say, we should do to blacks in the U.S. What? Imagine if just someone said exactly the same thing this much just says. I mean, Ben Gvir said the... Uh, look, the the, the 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 need for my family to be able to drive around the streets of the West Bank is more important than anything for the Palestinians. Smotrich said, Palestinians have three options. They can leave, they can die, or they can live subjugated to Israelis. I mean, just imagine somebody... And by the way, and by the way he put out a plan. It, it's not just a slogan. Yeah. He actually put out a plan. So you it's have very elaborate. A, a major Israeli minister with an elaborate plan of ethnic cleansing or murder or or uh, uh, or, or, or or departure. Uh, it's 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 unbelievable. It is unbelievable. But of and course, think- you know, people need to read that. They don't read that. They don't know. Uh, and uh, again, even these. You know, the Israel lobby isn't exactly going it's out of its way to give us a reading list. And so you have to search this stuff out. Yeah, absolutely. And the more time goes on, I think what's happening is just this cognitive dissonance that six months of just mass slaughter. I mean, people are, I mean, conditioning and propaganda is very uh, difficult to break. But I think a lot of people are beginning to just ask questions now because this doesn't sound like they're just out there to fight terrorism and get the hostages. I mean, there are certainly easier ways. It's, it seems... Very clear, as many of the hostages' families are saying, it's very clear that the last thing what Netanyahu wants at this point is a deal that frees the hostages. Because the real goal for him and for his coalition, it's a golden opportunity to use the hostages as an excuse to destroy all of Gaza, to use Hamas's intransigence and Hamas's fanaticism as an excuse to just destroy all Gaza, make it uninhabitable, and get hopefully a couple of million people to leave. That, that, uh, that's what Smotrich said. I think that's right. And if it isn't right, it would take five minutes for Netanyahu to make clear that it isn't right. Because all Netanyahu would have to say is, uh, and you may then agree or not agree or whatever, but he would have to say, our enemy is Hamas, but we agree uh, that there will be a Palestinian state, have no doubt about that. Of course, he's never going to say that. <laughs> this is antithetical. But if he did mean that this is about Hamas, then there's a, a, a way to say that and not lose the other 191 UN member states uh, putting uh, the United States uh, in this uh, limbo position as the 192nd, because there are 193 UN member states in all, and uh, none support uh, Israel to be the greater Israel, which is uh, what Smotrich and Ben Gavir certainly want and what I think, I mean, certainly what Netanyahu wants as well. So if it were really about security, Israel could say so in a way that is, at least from that point of view, clear. But the fact that Netanyahu, at a minimum, prevaricates about the post-war situation in Gaza really means, of course, that the goal is not defeat Hamas. The goal is greater Israel. And there's not the slightest attempt to 
uh, dissuade uh, anybody from that supposition, which he could easily do. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to also ask you, you you're uh, in touch with RFK Jr. and you're working as an economic advisor, I believe, to his campaign? Or Well, I, I'm, I'm a friend. We're classmates. Uh, I like him, but he does not have an acceptable position on this issue. Uh, and uh, I'm not endorsing him uh, under these circumstances because this is, to my mind, both in and of itself, extremely important. And as I've said to him, it's it's also a test. If you don't recognize this as a genocide, <laughs> what do you do? And so I'm trying my best to explain my point of view to him let me just say almost all the time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and so far, uh, not clearly uh, to any success. Yeah, I think it's, it's massively disappointing because, I mean, he was uh, one of the first candidates in a very long time in the U.S. that seems to be offering something different. When he talks about foreign policy, when he talks about all kinds of issues, he's even yeah. in monetary policy, he's open to Bitcoin and so on. Yeah. And then I, I like Bobby a lot, and we've been friends for. We were in school together more than 50 years ago uh, to show my age, but also to just point out we've known each other for a very long time. I like him enormously, but I cannot support a candidate that cannot get this right. I can't. Yeah. And of course, your hero is his uncle, JFK, and you've written a book about his uncle and his um, uh, quest. And what, what, are, what are your thoughts on the difference between the two of them? And how do you think JFK would have handled this? Well, I tell Bobby all the time, be like your dad and your uncle, because they were both heroes for me. Uh, and I believe, actually, I'm friends with a lot of the Kennedys, and I love the Kennedy family. Uh, and uh, and I love what uh, Jack, President John F. Kennedy and, and Robert Kennedy stood for. And Robert Kennedy was my, my first political love, because uh, John F. Kennedy, I was too young. Uh, but Robert Kennedy, I was... Uh, um, 13 uh, when he was assassinated and he was my candidate and uh, uh, you know that stays with you your whole life um, so what John F. Kennedy uh, believed in and learned especially uh, almost the hard way but uh, learned in his brief presidency was uh, to negotiate uh, and to try to find uh, peaceful solutions and he came into the presidency in 1961 <clears throat> saying in his inaugural address, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. He believed in talking. Uh, the next two years was very complicated uh, and not very successful uh, because the CIA put a plan on his desk to uh, invade Cuba and uh, Kennedy went along with it <clears throat> to his counter to his instincts, but he did go along with it. And that was the Bay of Pigs and it was a disaster. And it led Khrushchev to put in nuclear weapons into Cuba afterwards. And that brought us to the brink of nuclear annihilation in October, 1962. And Kennedy uh, was surrounded by advisors who said, take them out, military invade Cuba, which would have likely led to uh, nuclear annihilation. Uh, but Kennedy had the instinct, we can find a peaceful way out of this. And in a very complicated maneuver, when there was not a Zoom, not direct communication of, uh, of uh, global leaders, back channels, teletypes, slow communication, miscommunication, misunderstanding, he worked out a peaceful settlement uh, with Khrushchev. And in the following year, he did what I regard as one of the greatest acts of statesmanship of modern history, why I wrote a, a book called uh, uh, To Move the World, JFK's Quest for Peace. He negotiated a, a peace treaty, in essence, with the Soviet Union in the form of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And what's amazing about it is, and hard for you know uh, people to understand, Negotiating with the Soviet Union in 1963 would be like Biden. I mean, it's possible, but Biden's never going to do it. Would be like Biden standing up and say, I want to make peace with Iran 
or I want to make peace with China. Of course, he should do that. And Kennedy had the guts to do it and succeeded and made a great treaty, but it took tremendous guts. And he made a great speech on peace in June 1963 uh, that I absolutely adore. I think it's the greatest speech by uh, a president in modern history, one of the greatest ever. Um, and uh, I, that's what I wrote my book about, this peace campaign. And many people think, and I think it's absolutely plausible, that Kennedy was killed for his peace initiative in the same way that Yitzhak Rabin was killed for calling for peace, uh, in the same way that Martin Luther King was killed for uh, calling for racial justice, in the same way that Robert Kennedy was killed trying to uh, get America out of the Vietnam War. I mean, we have a very dark side and 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 there's a, not a small chance that this was a coup uh, in 1963 with the active CIA participation at the least that took Kennedy out. But to come back to your question, uh, these were acts of incredible human insight uh, of uh, John F. Kennedy to save the world uh, and then to move the world towards peace required, a, well, it required a great decency and humanity. Uh, and uh, decency and humanity can actually get you a long way. The first thing you do is you stop dehumanizing or vilifying the other and you start understanding that they are human beings. They have a history. They have reasons. And in the case of Palestine, plenty of excellent reasons uh, to want something different from what there is right now. And with some basic humanity, we could sort this out peacefully, not with slaughter or ethnic cleansing or genocide, but peacefully. Of course, we have a president who is, I think, almost surely physically incapable of doing this, uh, but also uh, by uh, dint of his whole political career, uh, intellectually and emotionally uh, incapable of doing this as well. Biden has never been a peacemaker. Biden has always been an agent of the military industrial complex. He's always been for NATO enlargement. He's always been for dirty tricks. He played a role in the overthrow of the Ukraine government in 2014. So I don't think he knows how to do this anyway, which is really terrible at this moment. And it doesn't look like any of the three main options for the next presidential election is going to be any different. I mean, uh, Trump seems to be um, similar in the sense of just being full on, uh, let give Israel everything they want. If he's critical of Biden, it's that he's not giving them enough. And JFK seems to be the same thing. I mean, it's 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 amazing uh, watching him just uh, turn into um, uh, you know evangelical Christian Zionist. Yeah, the sad part about Bobby is that uh, I think he'd actually win the presidency if he had the right platform, because everyone is so disgusted with Trump and Biden. Uh, I think Bobby could actually do it. Uh, and so even on purely pragmatic grounds, I wish he would do it. But of course, I want him to do it on deeper grounds. And I want him to do it on Kennedy grounds, which is make peace. It's possible. Don't dehumanize the other side. I keep telling him also, stop inflating Hamas as if it's this unbelievable, unbelievable monster that must be controlled and nothing can happen uh, without addressing that. There are nations, there are other countries, there's diplomacy, there are, there are ways to find peace. Uh, and, and so I'm hoping still somehow that uh, he'll come to that, but it better be quick. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's a lost campaign anyway. And what are your thoughts on what's happening in Ukraine? I know you've been very outspoken about this, and uh, you have very strong opinions about US policy there. What are your thoughts on how that is going and where it is going? Well, it's basically the same thing. It's a, it's a war that absolutely, unequivocally could have been avoided at repeated periods of time many of which I know well because I was an advisor to Gorbachev and to Yeltsin and to Kuchma, the second president of independent Ukraine. I know this region well. And basically, uh, 
Ukraine should have done what it said it was going to do when it declared independence, and that's remain neutral. And that's what the people of Ukraine wanted. They know that they're a bridge between Western Europe and Russia. Uh, and uh, as a bridge, be neutral on both sides. And they knew that, by the way, by overwhelming majorities. But the U.S. Uh, military industrial complex could not stand that. By the way, if there's one thing that uh, the uh, American deep state hates, it is neutrality. It's not enemies. They love enemies. <laughs> enemies uh, get you get you arm sales. They get you wars. They get you uh, able to practice uh, your military. But they hate neutrals. And the U.S. has a whole history of killing and overthrowing neutral leaders. By the way, it's stunning. If and it's the old slogan: If you're not with us, you're against us. And they really believe that because the statement is almost like a joke like a caricature, you know, that uh, Darth Vader would say in, in the Star Wars. But no, that's actually the American position. If you're not with us, you're against us. So they hate neutral leaders. And Ukraine wanted, the, the people understood this. They're so much uh, Russian and ethnic culture and uh, shared uh, orthodoxy and faith and many other things. And so they wanted neutrality. They did not want NATO. And yet we had our neocons, Newland, who's about to become my colleague at Columbia. Oh, my God. Congratulations. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> It'll be Hil Hillary and uh, Victoria. Yes, we said Ukraine has to become part of NATO. And that was a campaign that started in the late 1990s. Biden was absolutely on side on this. Victoria Newland was first Cheney's advisor then Bush's ambassador to NATO when they push for NATO enlargement, then Hillary's spokesperson, and then the assistant secretary of state for European affairs in 2014, when the U.S. actively participated in the overthrow of a neutral government and installed a government that said, we want NATO. So the war was provoked by NATO enlargement to this crazy degree, and by the way, completely against uh, all the promises uh, that had been made uh, by uh, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush Sr. Uh, and James Baker III and others to Gorbachev back in 1990 that NATO wouldn't move one inch eastward. Anyway, it kept moving, kept moving, kept moving, and then it was supposed to move to Ukraine and even to the country of Georgia on the uh, eastern uh, coast of the Black Sea, which definitely is not a North Atlantic country, <laughs> if one knows a little bit of geography, but it's this insanity of endless NATO enlargement. Well, su suffice it to say there were numerous exit ramps and the United States refused all of them. And even after the special military operation started on February 24th, 2022. There was an immediate exit ramp, and that was the direct negotiations between Russia and Ukraine calling for Ukrainian neutrality and agreeing on it in talks mediated by Turkey in Ankara. And they were close to an agreement, and the United States said, no, fight on, fight on. We don't accept neutrality. Fight on. And here we are till today, and Biden absolutely does not talk to Putin. All he does is insult a, a, a counterpart uh, who happens also to have 6,000 nuclear warheads uh, and is uh, beating to a pulp Ukrainians. And Biden's, uh, you know, clever ideas to call Putin a, a crazy SOB. You just cannot make this up. How immature, how puerile, how uh, ineffective, how destructive uh, the U.S. foreign policy is. It's just unbelievable. Any chance for peace, yeah. they reject because they don't believe in diplomacy. 
For me, I think what is the most unconscionable thing about it is when American politicians say, look, we're fighting Putin and it's not even costing us any lives from our military. And it's just, for me, it's so callous and criminal to just, yeah, well, we're we're burning all these young Ukrainian boys and men, uh, go, sending them to their graves. It's not quite Smotrich and Ben Gavir, but it's it's in the same ilk. You know, they literally say it's not American lives being lost. Richard Blumenthal, senator of Connecticut, explicitly on this greatest bargain that money can buy. Uh, Lindsey Graham. Uh, yeah. I can't even say on public company my true view of him. Mitt Romney. They're all like this. Uh, and so it is a kind of vulgarity. Say, if we're going to have to wrap up, uh, I'm afraid it's uh, incredible to speak with Likewise, you. we should have um, finished up uh, how Bitcoin fixes this. Ten years ago, I gave a presentation at Columbia and spoke to Bitcoin. You were a bit skeptical, but a couple of years later, you emailed me saying, okay, there's something there. So I just want to get a quick yeah. uh, reaction from you. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin? And let me just tell you why I think it fixes it. If the U.S. government can't print money, 90% of all of these problems are thrown out the door. If you just can't hand over tens of billions of dollars to military contractors to keep promoting more and more wars, people are going to have to find a way to talk and reduce those conflicts. It's not going to end conflict, but I think conflict will be a lot less bloody. Well, let's just say I agree completely that we need to find ways to talk uh, and uh, we need to discuss Bitcoin because there's uh, uh, it's it's been an amazing ride. Uh, you know, I'm I'm still, uh, I know it's uh, completely contrary to uh, probably almost every listener, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm still worried about completely uh, unmonitored uh, transactions, you know, for good or for bad, uh, because I kind of believe uh, in the rule of law. Uh, admittedly, I, my belief is predicated on the idea that governments uh, can be made to do the right thing. So I admit our whole conversation proves me wrong on that. <laughs> uh, and, and so I don't want to take an overly uh, stark view of this. I'm not uh, by instinct a libertarian because I believe there is such thing as the common good. And I believe uh, I'm a, basically an Aristotelian in, in my philosophy. I believe that uh, there can be government for the good, but uh, I know uh, that will run against the grain. And I have to say, I didn't give a single shred of evidence in favor of my views over the last hour of discussion. So I don't want to. I don't want to hold them uh, too true and fast. I want to. <laughs> Keep them open as provisional. Okay, well, I want to be mindful of your time. Thank you so much. We should do this again, and we should talk more often. We should get back. I hope so. Thank you so much for the time. Absolutely wonderful. Cheers. Thanks, Have a good so day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.